please welcome Dr. Paul Wilmot. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I, I don't recognize this guy that you just described. That's, that's, that's a bit too much for me to live up to, I think, too. I, I think. Uh, don't forget, though, that, um, well, when I was a lad, mathematicians, they were the geeks. But now, because they work in banking, they're the rich geeks, and they get all the hot chicks as well. So, <laughs> even though they are still very strange. Who here is a mathematician? One. Just one? <laughs> oh. Now, I see, they're very shy. This, this probably, you're probably all mathematicians. You're just very quiet. Just two mathematicians, come on. Who's not a mathematician? <laughs> uh, see, quite a few who haven't put their hands up. Uh, who's an economist? Okay. Because I, I, I guess I should really, I, I do want to include economists in there, but I am a mathematician. I'm a practicing mathematician. Um, but I also want to lay into econ uh, economists as well a little bit. My background is... Um, as, as an applied mathematician, uh, undergraduate applied maths, uh, maths and then applied maths, fluid mechanics, um, which somebody once said was actually the best um, background for someone working quantitative finance, fluid mechanics. And I worked originally in a thing, a subject called um, uh, industrial or applicable mathematics. That means applying mathematics to the real world. And any, anything at all. Um, my thesis was on something to do with submarine motion and aircraft wings. I worked on the design of um, turbine blades, manufacture of glass fibers. Um, the, the one really nice problem I worked on was, suppose you've got some st st sticks of explosive and you've got a cliff face. Where do you put those sticks of explosive to cause the maximum amount of rubble to to fall. Right? It's, a, it's a mathematical problem. It requires you to know about fracture mechanics, gas dynamics, ballistics, all sorts of things. And the, the idea is sort of uh, obvious. If you have, have the sticks of dynamite too near the edge of the cliff, then big bang, but just a lot of dust, but you don't do much to the interior of the cliff. But equally, if you have the, the sticks of dynamite too far back, then the ground will shake, but the rocks won't break off. So maybe there's an optimal place, and so I did the mathematics of that. Lots and lots of different things. Uh, also, uh, I wrote the, um, the seminal paper, in, or co-wrote, uh, perhaps even the only paper on shaving, the mathematics of shaving, how to shave. This was in the, um, this was in the early 90s. Um, we, we, I was coming back from a conference in Helsinki with a couple of colleagues, and we were on the plane, and it was, I know, a two, three-hour journey. And I suggested to them, why don't we write a paper on the, um, you know, just, just some any paper, we would just come up with some crazy idea, and we'll do the maths on the plane, and we'll write the paper. Now, this is before, before laptops, but we'll see how far we can get. Because uh, the idea, obviously, if you're an academic, which I was at the time, you have to write lots and lots of papers if you're going to, to progress. So, um, we thought, well, okay, well, let's go for it. Um, what, should we, what should we research on the plane? Uh, and I distinctly remember looking at one of the thinner stewardesses and thinking, Let's write about shaving. I don't worry about who it was, but let's do the mathematics of shaving. And that was the time, you, you know how these days you've got the I don't know, 27 blades or whatever it is you've got now. In those days, you only had the two blades. And the TV adverts went something like this. The first blade cuts you close, the second blade closer still. And there was a little animated cartoon of the, the first blade catching the bristle, pulling it, before it got cut, and then the bristle bouncing back above the surface of the skin to be caught by the second blade. All right? So that's all we had to go on. That was basically a TV advert. So anyway, we, we had to go on the plane, the three of us, we did some mathematical modeling and dynamics of a bristle, etc. We wrote the, most of the paper, and we finished it off when we, when we, got, um, when we landed. And uh, it got published. Amazingly, it got published, and uh, we started. To, we got. We started to get a bit carried away because we started to believe this essentially a toy model. This is a, what's called a toy model. It has some of the features of the um, uh, the real thing. Um, you know, for example, we found there's an optimum speed at which to shave. If you shave too quickly, it's like one blade. If you shave too slowly, the, the bristle has time to go back into the skin before the second blade. So, like like with the cliff the explosive thing, there's an optimum, which is always nice in a math problem. So, I mean, all, all you ladies and gentlemen, probably 
naturally shave at the, um, at the optimum speed anyway. So the, uh, we started to believe our mathematical model, and I phoned up um, Gillette, and we arranged to meet a wonderful lady called Joan Pumphrey at Gillette to talk about our research. And she was very keen to, to, um, to, to speak to us. But a few days before she, um, we were due to have this meeting, I got a phone call from Joan Pumphrey's boss. And he said, oh, please, Dr. Wilmot, don't, don't come to, down to, I think it was somewhere on the south coast, Portsmouth or somewhere. Don't visit us, us because Joan Pumphrey is a wonderful lady, but she's in her 60s. She only works one day a week. She's our only mathematical model. And if you guys from Oxford University come down, she's going to feel a little bit, you know, you know dominated or something. It, it's going to be a, a, an unpleasant experience. And she's about to retire, so let's, let's have the meeting. So he didn't bother with the meeting. And then a few, a few months later, one of my co-authors, a guy called Andrew Lacey, was going for an interview for a professorship at the University of Southampton. And he was sitting there being interviewed by these eminent people. And he, one of them said to him, like you can sort of imagine looking over the glasses, uh, I see on your CV you've written a paper about shaving. And Poor Andrew Lacey, who's a brilliant mathematician, he completely went to pieces. He'd been doing so brilliantly in his um, interview until that point, but then he just broke down, he went bright red, he started shaking and sweating, because it was not the highlight of his CV. That's, I think that's really the point. Now, I will proudly boast about this, this work, but, and he didn't get the professorship professorship, simply because he wrote a paper on shaving. Anyway, so anyway, that's my background. And then in the mid-80s, I, um, I, I was introduced to the subject of finance, and then I started um, uh, working more and more in finance until after about 10 years or so, I, comp I changed completely to finance. Because when I first saw the models in finance, I said, hey, these are, these are you know, the famous Black-Scholes derivative stuff. I said, this is fantastic. Um, it's these equations, the same sort of equations I've been working with all my adult life. Um, in fact, they're no harder than second year undergraduate maths, um, which is very true. Uh, and then I started working in the subject. Uh, th th for obvious reasons, as, a, as I've sort of hinted, the money's better and the, the women wear shorter skirts in banking than they do in, in uh, academia, which is nice. Um, <laughs> Can you say things like that in, in Zurich? I don't know. <laughs> you can't in England. Um, so, the, um, it, I had seen good models and I'd seen bad models. All right? I'd seen really, really solid mathematical models, like the, the equations of fluid mechanics. Very, very accurate. Uh, I flew here on a plane, which is designed by a computer solving the, those Navier-Stokes equations. But then I've also seen the toy models like the shaving model, for example. And finance is sort of in between. Quantitative finance, derivatives, risk management are sort of in, in between. Um, but something funny has happened in the last 15 years or so. Quant finance, well, when I first started quant finance, it was a very broad subject. You could actually do anything you liked. You could, take, you could work on any kind, of, um, any kind of mathematics you liked. For example, in the, in the mid-'80s, we were all talking about chaos theory. Uh, I remember I was, I was working on chaos theory and technical analysis, which of course no quant ever admits to doing, and stochastic calculus. I was doing all the, the class, two non-classical things and the classical thing. And you were able to do that without any criticism. Now, if, you'd, if you ever mention technical analysis to a quant, he'll, he will, you know, he'll turn his back on you. Um, you're only supposed to do a certain type of mathematics these days, otherwise, uh, people frown at you. Now, so we, we know there are a few mathematicians in the audience. I want to get, play a little game, if I may, just to get you into the spirit of, um, of the, the way I, I, I sort, of, sort of perceive mathematicians now. As, as you said, they, they do tend to get a bit carried away with the beauty of their mathematics, and they lose touch with reality. And to them, everything becomes mathematics, and they forget that actually finance is about human beings. Actually, the, 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 I, I read an, uh, an invitation to a, there was an invitation to some, some lecture in, in the UK, and I got an invitation to it, and the, um, the subject of the, I won't name the lecture, but the subject was how this lecture had come up with a new theory of economics. It's brilliant. 
This future Nobel laureate said that people buy and sell shares because of news and what people say. And then when people buy and sell the shares, it causes the share price to move. My God, how have we coped all these years without knowing this? Anyway, this was a new theory. Oh, Mind-boggling. Um, another thing, while well, I'm on the subject of economists, the, um, before we play this little game, um, I remember in the late 90s going into Imperial College Library, and I was just browsing the shelves. Uh, library, you remember libraries? You could just browse randomly and these things with I don't know, it was paper stuff. And I came across a book which was the, supposedly the UK Treasury's model of the UK economy. Okay, the Treasury's model of the UK economy. And this was quite a thick book, and it was just maths equations. And they were all difference equations. And these difference equations, were, um, there were 770 of them. That's the key thing is there were 770 equations. There was an equation for uh, an ex a few exchange rates, I expect. There were some in interest rates in there. There'll be some inflation, price of oil, and, uh, price of fish. I have no idea what 770 different variables they had. And complex um, nonlinear difference equations. And of course, because there are 770 equations, and the price of fish was somehow linked to the price of oil, etc., can you imagine how many parameters there must have been in this set of equations? That's why it was this thick. Of course, parameters, none of which you can observe at all. And I looked at this, and I thought, this, is, this has got to be some, some practical joke. This book cannot be for real. This cannot be what economists do, what, because I didn't know anything about economists in those days. Uh, because Every schoolboy, or every, actually every schoolboy, ought to know, let's say every first year undergraduate mathematician knows, that with a single nonlinear difference equation, just one, not 770, one with known parameters, you can get what's called chaos, i.e., something not random, not technically random, but completely useless for forecasting. And they had 770 of them. There was not a hope in hell that anything that came out of that model was going to be any good whatsoever. But you just can imagine, can't you, those people toiling away in these, the treasury, thinking, oh, our models are so rubbish. Why are our models rubbish? Oh, I know what it is. I need that 771st variable. And if I can find that, then I will solve it. Everything will be perfect. Of course, what the applied mathematicians said, the good ones, not one of these ones that I don't like, the good applied mathematician will say, you've just got to scrub out, get rid of all but maybe six equations. Six equations. And just accept they will never be perfect. But which are the six dominant ones and work with those? I believe, I don't know, people in the audience will know better than I, that since then, they have started to see the light, and I believe they've, they've decreased the... Um, uh, number of equations down to 150 or something, but still a long way to go. But that's just because the, these economists were not speaking to applied mathematicians. They, had, then they are not mathematicians, even though as I, said, I don't like mathematicians. Uh, some math it's just some mathematicians I have problems with. Um, and we're going to try and highlight in the audience who are those people that I don't like. Okay, that's what we're going to do now. We're going to play a little game. Uh, I want a. Um, I need a couple of volunteers. Okay, I want, we're going to imagine that we are at a magic show, all right? At a magic show. This is not a t talk about finance, etc., etc. And Europe, Europe is history, by the way. It won't work. It will never work just because of human beings are like that. Anyway, um, I am. No, I'm not going to say anything about Greece, but I'm fed up paying effectively 60% tax. I'm fed up with it. I'm up to here with tax. And those Greeks, they don't pay any tax. Anyway, so imagine I've got a pack of cards. You're not Greek, are you? You are Greek. <laughs> oh, God. See? You're still volunteer. You're going to mess it up, I know, on purpose. All right, you're at a magic show. I've got a deck of cards. 
Just imagine I've got a deck of cards, okay? okay? So take the deck of cards. First of all, is it an ordinary deck of cards? Just look through it. Okay. Um, how many cards are there? Are they all different? 52. 52, very good. Give it a good shuffle. Okay. Right, another volunteer. Give me a number. Nine. Nine, all right. Uh, give me a suit. You know, heart, clubs, etc. Diamonds, spades. Someone else. <laughs> give me a suit. I mean, so, do you know what I mean by suit? Clubs, clubs. So nine of clubs, all right. Hold the cards up and fan them. But turn them around so I can't see them. <laughs> okay. Very good. I'm going to reach in and pull out a card. Okay, got a card. And you can't see that card, right? You can't see what that card is. Let me put it up here. What is the probability of that card being the nine of clubs? What's the probability of it being the nine of clubs? One in 52? Oh, hey, that, who else said that? I said, heard quite a few 1 in 52s. Who says 1 in 52? Who says 1 in 52? Just one? Oh, quite a few. Any, any more? Don't be shy. Don't be shy. 1 in 52. Quite a lot of people saying 1 in 52. All right? There's a, there was another. You, you say 1 in 52. 1 in 52? 2,500. 2,500, sir. <laughs> I think you're in the, the wrong lecture. <laughs> <laughs> Ra Razors, yes, okay. Well, well I'm going to leave it. We can do that at the end. There'll be some time for questions about razors. I'll give a demonstration if you like. Um, I heard another answer. One. Why one? How did I influence the decision? We've never met before. If I'd known he was Greek, I wouldn't have chosen him. So why one? What do you mean I've influenced the decision? I'm not saying you're wrong, but why? Well, nothing is real and you choose the card. So if you want it to be, it depends on where the decision Well, I didn't see the cards, so I can't really... <laughs> Honestly, I didn't. Did I? Anyone else say anything? Anyone else agree with one? No one else is agreeing with you. Oh, another one. Why one? Because you heard which card you chose. Tell you why you Sorry? Oh, yeah, but we're imagining we're at a magic show where I've actually got a pack. I don't have a pack of cards, you see. The, that's the problem. I don't have a pack of cards, and I'm not a magician, otherwise I would really do this. But we're pretending that we're at a ma magic show, and I'm a magician. You, you, you with me? So he re you really had a pack, deck of cards. He, see, he believes. Okay. <laughs> so... It's impossible to be the Nine of Clubs. I, Okay, okay, all right, so this is not going well. This is going really badly. Um, who else thinks the answer is one? Okay, when did we start out? What was the context? Where are we? This is a magic show, right? What do mag magicians do? They do the impossible. They take a deck of cards, which, is, which he's really got, take the card out, and we get... I picked the card, the right card, because if... I'm a magician. I would not be relying on the laws of probability, right? Would I? Would I? It'd be very, you know. Okay, that didn't work. Let's do it again. All right. Think of another card and do it. I'd be here all day. Sorry? 5.8. Who? 5.8 percent. Why 5.8? Anyway, you sort of right over here when you said one, because if this is a real magic show, then I'd get this right, no? Okay, let's pretend I'm a really good magician. Let's do, take two. I'm a really good magician. This is really a deck of cards, and I've really taken a card out without looking at it. But I'm a really, really good magician. So now, what's the probability of this being the nine of clubs? Who said that? Yeah. Tell everyone. One. In here. One. Okay. Does that make sense? Do you think the answer is still one in 52? I'm, not, I'm just, a, just discuss opening. 
for discussion. What do you think? One or one in 52? Remember, I'm trying to pick out which people in the audience I don't like. So it's going really well. Okay. Do you think it's still one in 52? You think one. Good woman. So we had a few people who thought it was quite a few people who thought it was one in 52. Has anyone, any of those people changed from one in 52 to one? Anyone think, oh yeah, of course, the context matters. It's not just about the maths. Good. All right. So the, the maths answer, the point is, the maths answer is one in 52. But this is not a maths question, is it? This is about a magic show. And if I could really do magic tricks, then I would have done that, and I would have revealed what this card is. Does that make sense? So the answer is one, yeah? Has anyone ever been to a magic show? Have you been to a magic show? So when, when I go, the nine of... Oh my God, it's the four of spades. All right? That doesn't happen. That always happens. If you've been to a real magic show, that always happens. Because me going to you and picking out a card, and it, oh, it's the nine of clubs, is whew, boring. More interesting is that I got it wrong, but it turns out that this lady here has it tattooed, the nine of clubs, somewhere about her person, <laughs> which she will now reveal. All right? <laughs> now, that's a trick. That's a good trick. The, but the point is the context, all right? So actually, the answer is, is actually, it's we come full circle, because it could be that I accidentally, because it is an ordinary deck of cards, you check that, by mistake, I picked the nine of clubs. Because if I do that, then we don't get to see the tattoo. You see the point? So there's a whole story here about something that a large number of people really think is just a maths problem. Does anyone here still think it's one in 52? Good, good, I, I love you all. I did, I did this to a, a, a group of actuaries um, a year or so ago, the same, exactly the same idea. And went through the same, the same, they were much more cooperative, I have to say, than you lot. Um, they were all English. <laughs> and they, um, they, but right at the end, I asked the same question. Does anyone still think it's one in 52? And two people put their hands up. Two people out of 100 people. And I asked one of them, well, why do you think it's still one in 52? Having gone on about this magician stuff, and, you know, context and tattoos and whatnot. And the person went on about, oh, because of the sigma algebra and the filtration of that, he, all this maths, blah, he, was his reason for thinking it was still one in 52. And the entire audience, the rest of the audience, except for the, his friend, they all burst out laughing. Because how on earth could you be talking about all this maths when it's a magic trick, right? Then the interesting thing, somebody in the audience said, oh, that's because those two people are from the FSA, <laughs> all right? Which I thought was a joke, and it wasn't. Out of the 100 people in the audience, only two were from the FSA, and those were the two who could only think mathematically. They couldn't think outside the box, okay? So that was frightening. Now, that's the sort of thing I... Uh, one of the problems I have with mathematicians. So what time is it? Okay. Um, just going to go. I've got done some of these things. Uh, there's one topic that I'm t absolutely alone in, 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 in despising the people in, in banks and places do, and that's a subject called calibration. I'm going to uh, explain what that is and then explain why it's, it's wrong. I don't expect to convince anybody. If, 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 does, does anyone know what calibration is in a financial context? Two people, good, that's, 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 that's progress. Um, the idea of calibration is as follows, that um, we want to value some complex financial product. You know, I sort of thought I'd squeeze that in. Financial product. And um, when you're valuing a financial product, you need to have all sorts of parameters. Things like, well, the most important one is volatility. But you can't really measure volatility. Or you can sort of measure what it was in the past, but you don't know it's going to be the same in the future. So what are you going to do? And what people do is a thing called calibration. And they say, well, I've got this exotic financial product I want to value, 
and it, uh, it requires me to use volatility. I don't know what volatility is going to be, but I can look at vanilla traded, exchange traded instruments that depend on the same underlying. And because they've got a price in the market, I can back out a volatility. This is a thing called an implied volatility, which I'm sure you've, you've all heard of. And so I'm going to use that implied volatility in my to value my exotic financial product. That's calibration. That's sort of saying I'm making my exotic financial product consistent with the vanilla traded products. Now the problem is, the vanilla traded products, people buy and sell vanilla traded products for all sorts of reasons. Nothing to do with having any idea of what volatility is. People buy out of the money puts because they need protection. Okay? Uh, and they pay too much for it. Let me give an example. Not a financial example, then I'll do a physics example, and then I'll say it's all nonsense. The finance example, insurance, car insurance. I have a £20,000 car, and let's say, and um, annual insurance is £1,000. What is the probability of me crashing? Okay. What's hmm? Where? Crashing where? Good question, good question, good question. <laughs> Does anyone think that there's information in that, those two numbers, 20,000 and 1,000, about the probability of me crashing? Any information? No information? Not much information. Now, the, the quant will say, well, look, it's a 1,000 pound uh, annual premium, it's a 20,000 pound car, that means there's a 1 over 20, 5% chance of you crashing in the next year. That's what they'll conclude. That's the implied probability of me crashing. That's nonsense. Because that £1,000 premium is kind of an average among all people of a certain age, of you know, uh, impeccable driving, um, no points on my license at the moment whatsoever. The, also, it's supposed to include a profit, obviously, for the company. The, you know, you've got to pay the, the FTSE 100 uh, directors, their four million pound average salary, right? <laughs> so uh, where does that come from? It comes from part of that um, uh, th that one thousand. So really, that five per that five percent should be a kind of upper bound, allowing for profit, etc. But it may not be. It may be a really lousy driver. So it could be, but it's not five percent. In f in physics, you can calibrate things. This a spring. Do we have any physicists in the audience? Even shyer than mathematicians. Hooke's law. Do you know Hooke's law? Yeah, measure the dislocation of the, the angle of spring, which is minus the parameter times the dislocation, and by calibration you measure the parameter. Yes. <laughs> that is. Right. Take a bow. You have a spring, and you put a weight on the end, and the spring will stretch an amount proportional to the weight. So you take a spring, and you've no idea what this constant of proportionality is, and you've got a weight. You put the spring on the weight, let it fall, you know the weight, you can measure how much the spring has, uh, has gone down, so you've got F equals KX, F is the, the weight and X is the extension, uh, you can figure out what K is. Once you've done that, you can use it to measure anything at all, any, uh, you know, weigh other things within certain ranges. Um, and that K, that constant of proportionality, does not change. If that does change, then it means Hook, Robert Hook, has got the wrong model. But it doesn't change. So he's got a good model. When you do this in finance, of course, with derivatives, etc., those parameters are always changing. And because of that, it looks like you've got the right price for your exotic, because it matches the vanillas, but it, it doesn't at all. You come back a week later and recalibrate, and you find the parameters have changed, therefore the price has been wrong for the last week. Now it could be, now you've got it right. But no, 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 you come back a week later, you recalibrate and the parameters have changed again. You're never going to get it right. But the problem, the real problem is that by calibrating, you've hidden the parameter risk. You've hidden the risk in those, the model risk that's in there by doing this. So there's a, a very important and big risk that's there, which you've now hidden. Now, again, 
regulators. I went to visit some regulators in Washington a year ago, and I went in to say to these regulators, look, everybody knows that you're not paid very much, therefore you're not very clever. Now, um, <laughs> But I, I, I realized that wouldn't go down very well. So I, I, I phrased it slightly differently. I said, what you really need is you need to go into a bank, and they need to be frightened of you, because at the moment, they just laugh at you behind your back. Because you, you know, they think you're not very smart, but of course you are very smart. But you need one ki killer question. And that killer question, I was then suggesting, might be they go into the bank and say, how stable are your calibrated parameters? And the minute the banks are asked that, they will wet themselves. They will be terrified. They'll realize, uh-oh, the game is up, you know, take me away. I've been, I'm caught. Um, so I thought the, the, the regulators would be pleased with this, 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 this brilliant, trivial question. They didn't even need to know what the question meant. All right? They just had to repeat it, okay? Just write it down on, on your cuffs and go into the bank. How stable are your parameters? And, um, but you know what the regulator said? They said, oh, no, 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 no. We actually go into banks and we encourage them to, uh, to calibrate. So we actually encourage them to hide risk. He didn't say that last bit, but that's what he meant. So the, the, the regulators are helping banks hide risk. Ah. So I was right. They, they were stupid. Oops. Didn't mean to do that. Uh, finish on this, this example of something really, really, really dumb. I was at a, um, a, uh, a conference in, oh my god, it was Zurich. It was, it was a conference on, uh, it's going back a while, but it was in Zurich, on um, uh, alternative risk transfer, insurance, bonds, and things like that. And they were talking about, one of the, the, the talks was about modeling hurricanes and trying to do the maths of hurricanes so they, they could say, well, the, the damage that this hurricane would do would be so many billions. That was the idea. But they need, there were various, various stages to this, and they needed to have a mathematical model of, um, of what goes on in a hurricane. Because so, they wanted to just parameterize the hurricane by some simple, you know, simple numbers. They didn't want to do the whole fluid mechanics of, of the planet. So they wanted to do the maths of that. And one thing they had to do was they, they, they had to figure out what was the speed of the wind in a hurricane as a function of distance from the center of that hurricane. Okay? Speed of the wind as a function of distance from the center. Okay? A long way away, it'll be slow. In the middle, it'll be faster. In the middle, in the very middle, what will it be? Zero. It's not going anywhere. So what they had, they had some experimental data. And it went like this, sort of up a bit, and they reached some, some maximum, and then it kind of tailed off. Okay. Um, and the guy who was talking about this, he said, well, we needed to have a, a mathematical representation of this function, this shape. And so what he did was he went to a book of probability distributions. He'd been trained as a quant. He'd done quant finance, he'd done a master's in financial engineering, no doubt, and therefore he thought he was a mathematician. He wasn't, because he'd only ever done a little bit of probability theory. He knew nothing about hurricanes. So he went to a book of probability distributions and found some shape that looked roughly like this. Okay? And he worked with that shape thereafter. Now you have to ask yourself, what on earth has probability got to do with the speed of wind in a um, hurricane? He might as well equally gone to say a, a collection of the cartoons of Picasso and said, which one looks most like this? Equally meaningless. But he only knew about probability theory. And he was talking about this, and I was completely, I was shocked. Because there are billions that are going through this. You know, this was the, the company who did this uh, research were the big name in this sort of research. And they were completely stupid. And of course, this is worth billions, this particular thing. So the mathematicians, anyone do hydrodynamics, or any, who's done hydrodynamics? No one, yes, okay. Does that ring any bells, that shape? It's going back a while, is it? All right, we can, we can do it, we can all do it, we can all do it. In the middle of the, if I, if I were to spin this glass round, 
It starts off with, with the, the water, which represents the air, being still, and the glass just moving around. But because of viscosity, eventually the, the water starts to rotate at the same speed as the glass. All right? So how fast is the water going round as a function of distance from the center? It becomes a solid body rotation. So what's that relationship? This is not the gin I asked for. <laughs> what, is the, what is the function? In the middle, it's zero. It grows linearly. It's a solid body, it becomes. So the further out you are, which, which is exactly what happens on the first book. You've heard of the concept of the eye of the storm, etc. There's a bit in the middle that's a solid body rotation. And then, again, any second year undergraduate mathematician will tell you that what happens outside is what's called an irritational flow, and that has a behavior one over the distance from the center. So you have a rotational core followed by a one over R. In other words, Basic second-year undergraduate hydrodynamics will tell you everything you need to know about what's going on in a hurricane, and yet this man was paid crazy amounts of money to look up the thing in a book on probability, which is the stupidest thing I've ever seen. This, of course, happened a few years ago. It was before I became, before the Prozac, and I became quite so um, <laughs> aggressive on stage. All right, thank you very much. I'll stop there, and I'll, I'll take a few questions. Very good, Paul. Thank you. Am I allowed to reveal my tattoo now? Please. <laughs> Just kidding. Any questions to Paul Wilmot? It's the ace of They're space, all scared really. now, you know? Yeah. No, he wants to talk about shaving. Uh, Wilkinson Sword and Gillette have a deal uh -huh. where they shave, well, they uh, shelved the razor that would probably last six months oh, or more. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Could you tell me the probability of that being true? Oh, really? Mm, very high. I'm not I a guess. conspiracy theorist, but that sounds good, doesn't it? That sounds really good. Because anyone who says, I don't believe in conspiracy theories, immediately you know that they do. Do you, do you want to hear the best ever conspiracy theory? This is really freaky, OK? Because I, I really don't, but this is really freaky. Do you know the film, um, the, the Magnificent Seven? The cowboy movie? Yul Brynner and who knows the Magnificent Seven? Yeah? Oh, oh well, um, well, well, you know, you know <laughs> the Magnificent Seven. Right. Okay. Do you remember in the movie, you probably don't remember the details, that they, they died. They all died one after another. Okay? Except for, I think, one was left standing at the end, and he came back in Return of the Magnificent Seven. But they, they all died one after another. Do you know that in real life, the actors died in exactly the same order as they did in the film, with one guy still alive, who was, who was alive at the end? Do you know that? Oh. Isn't that freaky? <laughs> hey, it is. Sorry, Karen, what's the probability of that? <laughs> Scary. Any more questions to Paul? They are well, friends. while we wait, uh, a few years back, Paul, you said that uh, you were convinced that politicians would remain in the dark for many years to come. Is that still the case, or do you think the crisis has taught them some lessons? Do they have a better clue, or at least some of them, of what's actually going on in the world of finance? No, there, are, there are two stories. One I can't tell you because we're being recorded. Uh, it involves <laughs> David Cameron and a dear friend of mine. The other is I'm supposed to be on some, on some um, committee to look into the dangers of high-frequency trading. I was put on this committee about a year or two years ago, and we haven't met yet. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> that says it all. Well, you mentioned also that, uh, and you even wrote that in a blog a few years back, that uh, was titled, Europe, what's the point? In it, you said that most arguments in the EU's favor were complete nonsense. There's absolutely no reason for a club of such different peoples to succeed. Quite a statement to make at a conference where also Otmar Issing and other... <laughs> well, I, I think the, the idea European behind are. Europe was just the egos of a few politicians, a few, you know a few decades ago, and um, I, I don't think anybody who's thought about it for more than five minutes thinks that, that, that Euro is a good idea or that, oh, we can all be friends. Um, we just don't have to, and, but, but forcing people together in a way that, that they don't want to be together is not the way to, to, to um, uh, make people friendly. If you want people to trade, etc., and get on really well, then you've got to give them a little bit of space. Uh, mm. And my comments about Greece and not paying taxes I, I'm, I'm surprised that, that, that there hasn't been more issues about that, mm. actually, because individuals must 
hate the thought of paying more taxes to bail out some people. And you know, a lot of famous Greek people are not paying any taxes. They're, they're being named and shamed as we speak, I understand. Mm. Well, we earlier um, had an argument in the panel discussion uh, that the UK aren't necessarily better off by not having joined the euro back right. then. If you look at the know. economy. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I, th th yes, there certainly are a lot of um, uh, companies going, going bust in the UK. It doesn't feel like a recession. Uh, my businesses are doing fantastically well. Um, but um, others are not doing so well. Uh, I don't know. I, th I think the key thing, I, 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 the way economists are obsessed with growth, obsessed with growth. I, I, uh, why, 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 why? Um, it's, it, it, well, first of all, the, the people say, well, we need growth because we need, because things like um, oh, um, expanding populations, etc. we need, well, as a mathematician, I'd say what you need to measure then is not growth. You need to do a sort of kind of, a kind of GDP or something divided by population number. Uh, rescale it. So if the populations are going down or, or stable, you don't need any growth. Why do you need growth? It, it cannot be st stable to have a, a, a system where you, like, like a shark, a shark, I don't know if this, is, this is an urban legend, but it has to keep swimming to live. If it stops swimming, it dies. Well, I don't see why. Why does the, the world have to be like that? It can't be like that. You also hear about, oh, we need immigration into this country, into you know, the UK and other countries, um, to, to whatever, to stimulate stuff. You can't have immigration into every country. You know that, don't you? Okay? <laughs> They've got to come from somewhere. <laughs> Jeez, no, it's, it's just stupid. I think, I think the problem with economics is that people don't think about it very deeply. They have a lot of shorthand for things that are complete gibberish. They, they come up with some, some law that they think is, makes sense, and then they stop thinking about it, and then it becomes, they, they build all sorts of edifice on this shaky law, and they stop questioning that law. <laughs> you see what I mean? It's, uh, it's dumb. I think we need more, um, I mean, some shopkeepers running, running the... Uh, Europe. I think shopkeepers know everything, right? They mm. understand human behavior like economists don't yeah, understand. That's true. Um, <laughs> anyway. Okay, final chance. Any more questions to Paul? In that case, thank you very much. Thank it was you. very entertaining. Thank you very thank much you. for sharing your insight. <laughs> Dr. Paul Wilmot.